Okay, hey everyone. Thank you so much for joining this session on negotiation. Um, I'm going to focus on tips that apply for founders, freelancers, and professionals. Um, but seeing as we're a smaller group, if you could just write in chat what you are going to be negotiating ne negotiating soon. Um, so whether you're like trying to move jobs, maybe like negotiating a contract, or if you're a freelancer negotiating a gig, or if you're a founder like thinking of like negotiating terms with investors, uh, it would be great to have the background so I can like tailor it uh, specifically to you. Uh, I'm going to be working off of a Google sheet today. So uh, don't worry too much about taking notes. I will share the link to the sheet with you um, uh, here in chat. And um, you're welcome to make a copy, keep it. Uh, but for the time being, I'm going to share my screen and just walk you through these negotiation tactics. If at any point you have questions, please feel free to use the Q&A. There is a lot of research that shows that when men and women negotiate in the same style, we reach really different outcomes. So I am leveraging research that has been proven to help women succeed in the realities of patriarchy. Uh, so I hope this information will be really useful for you, but please feel free to ask as many questions as you want. Without further ado, let us begin. So you should see this Google Sheet. Let me know if not. Okay, so first of all, hi everyone, nice to meet you. My name is Abadesi. I am the founder of Hustle Crew. For the last four years, my company has been using talks, training, and mentorship to make tech more inclusive. And as much as possible, I try to offer careers advice for women and other underrepresented groups in tech to navigate, which is unfortunately a playing field that is not level. So let's just start out with the narrative around negotiation. You might be surprised to know that according to research by McKinsey, women professionals actually negotiate the same amount as men. They just face really different results. So while women, while men who ask for pay rises tend to get them, women don't. And on top of that, when we do ask for pay rises, we're seen as aggressive and we're seen as not being a team player. So this is of course really unfortunate but it ultimately stems from patriarchal ideas about gender roles. So we have really outdated ideas about what um, an ideal uh, woman should be like. And often it's someone who's very pleasant and doesn't conflict or like, um, you know, have any more assertive uh, ways of communication in the office. Whereas like with men, because of these outdated and inaccurate <laughs> ideas of gender, uh, men are often expected to be really assertive and expected to you know, fight for their worth. Um, so it's really important for us as women to change this narrative, to make it easier for future generations of women to negotiate. The biggest blocker to negotiating right now is that people just don't expect women to negotiate. They expect men to, but they don't expect women to. And the only way we can change that norm is if all of us negotiate more, right? So I like to think of negotiation a bit like our muscles, okay? The first time you try to do a push up, it's really hard, okay? You can barely do one, let alone do five in a row. But the more you practice, your arms and shoulders get stronger. Before you knew it, you're doing 20 push ups, no sweat. In a similar way, negotiation requires you to practice it, okay? It feels awkward talking about money, especially in British culture. It feels awkward to ask for more when we've already been given an opportunity, like a freelancing gig or a new job. But the reality is no one is ever gonna come to you with their maximum budget up front. So you need to get comfortable with pushing back and getting into that kind of tennis match rally where you kind of go back and forth asking for things. Now, hopefully the tactics I share with you will allow you to do that. So think of this as your negotiation toolkit. There are three stages of negotiation. I'm gonna take you through all of them. That should bring us up to just past two. And then I'm gonna leave some time for questions or sharing some more specific examples from my career. So the three stages of negotiation are one, preparation, which arguably could be the most important one. Second is practice. So once you've done all of the research, how do you actually start practicing that conversation? Now, I don't know about you, but sometimes the conversation is the scariest and hardest bit. 
you know, you can do all the research you want, but if the person on the other end is like really not giving you anything or they're really like curt, uh, really like cold, it's quite hard to like carry on with the negotiation. So it's really important for you to practice so that you can anticipate even like the worst case scenario and still be prepared. The final, final part of our negotiation strategies and toolkit is execution. So that's the third piece that we are going to cover in a bit. Um, just a heads up, I know some of you are uh, consulting and want specifically insight for negotiating with clients. As we go through each of the stages, my plan is to talk about how you could apply that as a, as a contractor, as a freelancer, as a professional, and as a founder. Uh, so it makes sense for all the different groups. But again, please do be very liberal in your use of the chat function. All right, so let's start with preparation. So think about what your desired outcome is. If you're a consultant, you're probably going to be thinking about how much money you need to make every month and how many hours you can work every month. And then based on that, you're probably going to be coming to some kind of ideal day rate. Okay, so, you know, if realistically, you can only do two days a month, two, four, six, eight. Um, and maybe in that eight days of work, you need to make the, you know, three or four K that you need to earn a month to live off and save, etc. Then your day rate is going to be four or four K divided by eight. Right. And that's going to be like the ideal number you want to charge your clients. Um, but of course, like our outcomes are not only material, right? So, maybe your motivation for this negotiation is to be asking for more flexibility. Like maybe you want to change the terms of your work. It's not just about money. Maybe you're trying to relocate. Well, not in this climate, but <laughs> you know, when it's safe to do so, um, the most successful negotiations occur when you have put that time into understanding your needs better. So reflect on past experiences, like reflect on past contracts that you worked on and enjoyed, past contracts you worked on and didn't enjoy. Same for jobs, same for projects. Like try to gather as much data as you can from your own firsthand experiences to form that ideal scenario that you want to negotiate towards, right? And, you know, do remember, you're always negotiating a package. It's not just about the cash. It's even about the way that you're working, when you're going to be communicating, how you like to communicate. So try to build up a holistic image of your desired outcome as a professional, as a freelancer. If you're a founder, then you're probably thinking like, who is that ideal investor I want to work with? What are their credentials? And what's the way I want to work with them, right? So really do spend a lot of time diving deep, doing that introspection and trying to understand exactly what it is that you want. Now, of course, there's the part that you do internally, right? Going through those journal entries, speaking to friends, like painting a picture that resonates with you and your desires. But there's also the research you do that applies to the outside world, right? So you need to understand your market value. We often use this term in tech, like benchmarking, but ultimately what a benchmark is, is like a data point that very closely relates to the data you want to find. So if I want to find out how much I should charge someone for a day's work consulting on community management, it would be very sensible for me to speak to people that already do that and ask them what they charge. And I can then compare myself against them. So, you know, do they have the same years of experience as me? Have they worked at the same tier of companies as me? You need to really try to get as much market data as you can to understand how realistic your ask is. Now, I know what you're thinking. Who's going to tell me how much they earn? No one's going to do that. You're wrong. Some people will do that. Um, I very boldly ask people to tell me what they charge. Uh, and in a similar way, when I was working full time, I would ask people what they earn. We're living in an age of data as well. If you go on tools like Glassdoor or Indeed, even Google Jobs, you can get a lot of real salary data that people have shared. There are Twitter threads that go around. Um, so, you know, do your best to find like real 
actual data points from people and even better if they're men okay because the gender pay gap is real so don't only do a sample of women if you're trying to find out the market value of you know your day rate at your level of expertise and experience or your salary range at your level of expertise and experience um, try to try to get as many real real points of information as you can um, the other thing to think of is like how much bargaining power you have okay so what do we mean uh, by bargaining power so at the moment um, unfortunately there's of course like a lot of unemployment along with economic uncertainty but regardless there are still like certain skills that are in high demand so if you happen to have a skill that's in high demand, that means that you have a lot of bargaining power. So you can actually charge more than your market rate potentially. Now, if you have a skill that is an oversupply, you need to take that into consideration, right? So you might have less bargaining power when you're going to meet with clients, or if you're getting a job offer, you know, right now there's a lot of people looking for a job and not that many open jobs. So people like myself, I was recently laid off from a full-time role. As I look at other full-time roles within the tech industry, I have to acknowledge the fact that I don't have a lot of bargaining power compared to my uh, prospective employers, because while I have really unique skills and experiences, there are also a lot of people with similar skills and experience who have also recently been laid off, who might be competing for the same roles. So that's just something really important to think about. When the bargaining power is in your favor, it's incredible because you can push for the upper limit. Okay, so also think about the other side of the table, right? Whether that's an investor, a potential employer, a contractor, client that's gonna take you on as a freelancer, the more you can understand their needs and their motivations, the more you can use language that connects those dots and makes them more likely to say yes to you. So you can frame all of your, your preferences in the context of how they want to work. So, you know, if they really value um, diversity and inclusion, you can say that, you know, you bring your unique perspectives based on your unique identity, and that's going to add value that they, they don't have because maybe they don't have a black woman on their team yet. Um, so just, try to really uh, put yourself in their shoes and then think of like how you can communicate with them in a way that resonates with what you know about them from the research you've done. The final parts of preparation really just relate to the cold hard numbers, okay? So whether you're about to go into a new role, permanent role, part-time role, or whether you are uh, about to make a quote to a prospective client as a contractor, freelancer, you should know what your upper limit and lower limit are, okay? So, you know, sometimes people call this like their don't get out of bed number, but the idea is like, you have an idea of what your outgoing costs are any given month. You know how much money you need to pay your rent, pay your bills, put a bit of money away for a rainy day, goodness knows what else. And as a consequence of that, there's gonna be like a, a lower limit number that you absolutely cannot work for less than okay so let's say for example myself here in london it's very unrealistic for me to take a job that pays me 18k because it's i'm going to struggle i'm going to struggle to maintain my lifestyle um so of course we're all individuals we're all unique but you need to think about what is that lower limit what is that lower limit and don't be shy okay i know people are trying to get free stuff right now because the economy is going through its its own thing but you still need to feed yourself okay and you still need to take care of yourself so um don't let yourself fall into a situation where you're being taken advantage of because ultimately you are still adding value delivering a product delivering a service um don't undervalue yourself just because things are uncertain at the same time what is your upper limit right so as much as i would love to like rock up to clients and be like yo my day rate's one million pounds i'm not going to do that because <laughs> that's completely unrealistic right no one is going to pay me that much money i mean most of the companies i work with don't even turn over that in a year so i can set an upper limit that's realistic based on the research i've done so um again if we're thinking as freelancers if I've like done a lot of surveying to find out what people's day rates are and no one has said anything higher than 800 pounds, even people who I've been really impressed with because they have crazy high credentials, then maybe I should consider whether that should also be my own upper limit, right? Because I don't want to 
uh, come across as like, you know, someone who's maybe like asking for too much, not realistic, or maybe like convey this idea that I charge so much because I do so much, right? Ultimately, um, you kind of want to manage expectations for your own performance and delivery as well. Um, and then finally, consider your BATNA. So BATNA is a phrase from like negotiation theory, academic negotiation theory, but really it just means what is your best alternative to a negotiated agreement? So let's just say I just got a job offer and they want to pay me 35K, okay? So they want to pay me 35K. Now, let's say right now where I am, just working full-time on what used to be my side hustle, but now my full-time hustle, hustle crew, um, I would have to like weigh that up, right? Because that's actually like, you know, half of what I'm aiming for in terms of a, a full salary. Um, and if I just worked full-time on hustle crew, I could probably make 35K through my, through my social enterprise, right? Just by like hustling on selling talks and workshops. So in that scenario, um, I can obviously try to negotiate more with this offer that's come in, but if they say to me like, okay, you know, we really can't give you more than 35K, my best alternative to a negotiated agreement is to not accept the offer. It's for me to just stay where I am because it's like, well, you know what? I'm kind of looking for jobs. I pay way more than that. And I could just work full time on my social enterprise for the rest of the year and earn 35K on my terms and my time. And I'd, I'd be a lot happier with that. Um, so you have to always know when you go into a negotiation, what is effectively your plan B, right? So if you do not get to an agreed negotiation, like get to a point where you agree, what is your best alternative? Your best alternative maybe is another offer. Awesome. Sometimes it's just to do nothing, just to say no and stay where you are. Let me know if there's anything in that section on preparation that isn't clear or that you would like to get more information on. Um, use the chat function, um, whatever makes sense for you. Okay, no one said anything, so I'm gonna move on to the next section. Okay, so the next section is practice. Now, um, I am someone who feels more confident the more I practice something. And this is definitely, definitely true of negotiations. So I'll be that weirdo that like stands in front of the mirror and is like, so Abadesi, how much are you going to charge to deliver this consulting project for us? And I'll be like, 5,000 pounds. And here's the breakdown. Boom, 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 boom. So I, I will have that conversation in the mirror over and over again until I feel confident enough to do it on the phone or on Zoom. And I really encourage you all to do the same. So let me just jump through this list I've made for you. It's really important to rehearse and also anticipate blockers. So I'm the kind of person where I am like very responsive to the person on the other side of the table. So if the person on the other side of the table is like smiling and positive, then I will also be like smiling and positive. But if the person on the other side of the table is like resting bitch face, then I'm gonna like immediately start to feel a bit anxious and be like, okay, now I need to like do more to make this person like me so that they say yes. Uh, and as a consequence of that, you know, I would call that like a blocker, right? A blocker to me, is when the person on the other side of the table isn't giving me anything, when they're kind of negative. So um, I'm encouraging all of you, when you're thinking of your upcoming negotiation, to not only practice it, but also like anticipate what could be the things that throw you off your game, that set you back a bit, that make you feel a little nervous, a little hesitant. So first of all, write down your plan. Um, you should probably already have an idea of how you're gonna communicate uh, the number that you want to this person. Like maybe you have been on emails. So, you know, if you're going to like take it off emails onto a call, maybe you already have a call scheduled. Maybe you have a video call coming up, but whatever you, whatever you're going to do, you want to literally write down your plan. So the plan might be, I am going to explain all the things I'm really good at and how I'm going to apply them to this opportunity. And then I'm going to say, how much I want to take on this opportunity. Whatever it might be, just write it down. Then I want you to identify flashpoints. So flashpoints in a way are almost like triggers, yeah? What are the things that people 
are likely to say during this negotiation conversation that you need to practice responding to so that it doesn't throw you off and it doesn't um, deflate you. So often when we are asking for money, whether it's asking for a pay rise or asking for a pay bump on an offer, whether it's a new client we're trying to take on, uh, whatever it might be, the very, very common excuse we hear is, we have no budget, right? And it's like, oh, what? So you're just like running a company on air? That's interesting. Um, but, you know, people will often say they have no budget. So think about what you're going to say uh, in response to that. So you might want to challenge them on that and be like, oh, okay, I understand you have no budget for diversity and inclusion training. Is it important for you to retain the women and other unrepresented candidates that currently work on your team? Now, it'd be really bad if they said no to that, right? Like, no, we don't care about our unrepresented candidates. So then you could kind of like counter back and be like, okay, well, interesting. How are you planning to retain the women and underrepresented candidates in your team if you're not making any resources available to support them, for example, through diversity and inclusion training? So because I have practiced, right? When that flashpoint comes, I'm like, pow, there's my comeback. Again, what happens if you've just got a new job offer or you just landed a new client and they're like, this is what we're paying for the project or this is what we've allocated for this hire. We don't negotiate on this. I've been there before. Now, when I was younger, I fell for that. I was like, okay. Um, but you know, even that really like isn't much of a statement. Like you can just go, go back to them and it'd be like, oh, okay, so you don't negotiate on it. How important is it for you to find the right person who can truly excel at this opportunity and, and maximize value for your company? And they're gonna be like, oh, wow, yeah, very, very important. And be like, okay, cool. And how important do you think it is for people who take on this opportunity to feel motivated to work their hardest and excel in that role? And they might be like, yeah, very, very much so. And you'd be like, oh, okay, cool. So how can people be motivated to excel in the role if they're not receiving their market value compensation for it? So again, when you think of the flashpoint in advance, you can prepare a response to it. Another thing could be, oh, okay, yeah, sure, we can pay you, but you're gonna have to wait however many months, five months, six months, 12 months. Again, if you've anticipated that they're going to say that, then what you can say is like, oh, okay, well, how important is it for you to make progress on these goals? Or how important is it for you to keep this project moving forward? And if they go like, oh, wow, it's like very important. And you'll be like, how urgent is it? Like, how soon would you like this project to start? And they might be like, well, you know, we want this project to start right away. In which case you can reply, great, well, I'm willing to start right away. But of course, I, I have to be compensated for my time. Anyway, I'm just giving you some examples, but what I'm trying to say is like, it's upon you before the conversation happens to anticipate that script, right? And write your own lines accordingly and then practice them. So as you can see, I've said over here, rehearse, debrief, repeat. If you can get a friend, someone, or maybe someone that you meet today at the Fearless, shoot, maybe even me, I'll help you. Add me on LinkedIn, let's chat. Um, what you want to do is you want to rehearse this conversation. Okay. So like once you've decided, okay, I'm going to do it. I'm going to ask for 800 pounds a day or, okay, I'm going to say that I'm expecting 75 K base plus a 10 K signing bonus, whatever it is, whatever it is, you want to rehearse that conversation. And then you want the person on the other side to give you feedback. So if I, was giving you feedback. Some of the things I might be looking for are whether you rushed the ask or whether you weren't speaking clear enough, loud enough. Maybe you weren't coming across confidently in your ask. These are the kinds of things that you might just want to keep practicing on uh, until you can really get a confident delivery, right? If you're going to be asking someone for a lot of money, if I'm going to walk into a place and be like, I'm going to charge 3,000 pounds for a two hour workshop on understanding bias in the workplace and only 10 people can attend because you know the more people that are there the less value for each person I can't be hesitant in my ask right I'm charging that because I know my shit and that is the value that is the time it's taken to develop it and the time it's going to take to deliver it and that's the value of my time so the more you practice the more confident you will appear, the more conviction you will have for that number. And that confidence you have in yourself transfers to the other person. 
if you come to me and start telling me that that is how much you charge because you are worth it, I'll be like, okay, I see you and I hire you. Um, so really, really, really nurture your power and nurture your confidence. I cannot stress this enough, okay? If you're not practicing it, if you're not demanding it, it's not gonna happen. So that is the second part all about practice. Again, if you have any questions or anything isn't clear, please use the chat, holla, let me know. Um, otherwise, I will move on to the final bit, which is the execution. So, sports analogy alert. If you are an athlete of any kind, you can kind of think of the negotiation conversation like a match day, right? Uh, or any other type of performance you have to do. It's not just about you, it's about all the other elements and how they come together. Um, so, timing. Timing is very, very, very important. There is a research study that shows the likelihood of prisoners receiving parole from a judge. And this research showed that if your parole hearing is before lunch, you are disproportionately less likely to be granted parole by the judge than if your parole is after lunch. Why? Because people are grumpy when they're hungry, okay? Um, for this then I always try to have client meetings <laughs> and conversations after lunchtime. Uh, but anyway, you know, that one example aside, timing is super, super important. So if someone has contacted you and they're telling you that they've had a role open for a month and they really want to find someone to hire it, timing is on your side. Timing is on your side, especially if you're available right away. You can be like, oh, okay, well, I'm actually available right away. Let's talk. And once you know they want to bring you on, going back to that bargaining power, you're suddenly like, uh -huh, this is great timing for me. In a similar way, if you want to have a conversation with someone about money, especially in this climate where people are holding those purse strings so tight, you want to make sure you're having that conversation when the person on the other end really has the headspace to think about it. And in that way, what I'm trying to say is, hey, is now a good time to talk? If the person on the other side is like, Roy, I've got five minutes before I rush into the next thing, you just want to be like, okay, do you know what? That's not going to be enough time for us. Why don't we chat later today, like when all your other meetings are done or tomorrow or next week? You know, you want a favorable outcome for yourself. So you want to catch that person at a time where they can really uh, give you their ear and not be distracted by anything else. So really, really think about timing. Okay, so this is a very controversial point. I'm just gonna like start out with this disclaimer. I do not like the fact that as a consequence of living in patriarchy, women have been socialized to put others' discomfort before our own. So this has been proven in a lot of research. We would rather uh, like fill in an awkward silence uh, then sit in an awkward silence. Now, the reason I mentioned that is very important for a point I'm gonna mention later. Related to this, right? Consequence of patriarchy, uh, as I was alluding to at the beginning of the session, is that women are also expected to be very pleasant, right? So while men in the workplace can kind of like go in, like, you know, super aggressive, bullhorns, yeah, let's close these deals. Women were supposed to be like, oh my God, I just love working here so much. Um, and that really frustrates me, okay? Because I think we should be treated equally, treated fairly, and be able to behave however the hell we want. But alas, that is not the case. So sometimes I just think, okay, sometimes you just need to understand the rules of the game and play to win. And while we continue to live in patriarchy, which we do, unfortunately, there are not that many female CEOs and there are not that many female senior leaders yet, uh, all the research shows that when women negotiate, we should aim to be likable. Okay, likable. And I like to think of this as the smile game. So an observation I've made in the last few years is you can say stuff that is pretty out there, pretty bold, sometimes even negative, but if you do it while smiling, people are okay with it. So a really good example of that is someone being like, 
oh, I'm so sorry, like we only budgeted 300 pounds for this talk, so we're not gonna be able to pay you the 500 pounds that you asked for. I'll be like, oh my God, okay, cool, I understand that. Well, I actually don't do any work for less than 500 pounds. Um, I know it sounds silly, but like it, it genuinely works. And in a similar kind of way, if someone's like coming back to you again saying, oh, you know, this is a, a junior position, we've only budgeted, you know, 30K for this, and you, you said your last job paid you 40, 45, we don't know if we can do that. Again, just play the small game and be like, well, I know it's really important for you to hire someone with, you know, my unique set of skills and experiences, and it's really important for me to get my market value, which is 45. Um, again, you know, asking it like that, instead of being like, I want my 45. I want my 45, not that any of you are gonna do that. Um, but it, it, it does have an impact on the outcome of the conversation. So this quote, be relentlessly pleasant, comes from uh, an amazing book called Ask For It, which is all about how women can negotiate at work to have more favorable outcomes. And um, the, um, the phrase I find just so, so valuable, so, so useful, right? Um, be relentlessly pleasant. It costs nothing for us to smile. I mean, as women, we're experts in faking it, right? So um, be relentlessly pleasant, even if the person is annoying, even if the person is really trying to drag you, just, just keep smiling, just keep smiling. Just be like, mm-hmm, mm-hmm, I hear you, I hear you, yes. Um, and as I mentioned, you know, I've done a lot of research on this, I've spoken to a lot of my peers, and this is the price I'm, I feel confident about, or this is the salary I feel confident about. Just just keep on smiling and keep on holding your ground. Now, there's only one thing you take away from this entire workshop. If there's only one thing, let it be this. Silence is power, okay? When you drop your number during this negotiation, wait, okay? As I mentioned earlier, don't be that person that fills in the awkward silence. Don't be the person that starts discounting your own number before the person says anything, just wait, okay? So here's an example. Abrasi, thanks so much for agreeing to participate in our conference. Can you just confirm how much you'd like to charge for the keynote? Yes, thank you. Thanks again for the opportunity. I'm really excited to, to speak to your audience. For a keynote speech, I usually charge 1,500 pounds. 1,500, oh goodness. We, we were thinking of uh, just paying around 500. 1,500 you say, hmm, yeah, hmm, interesting. Yeah, I mean, definitely a lot higher than what we budgeted. Yeah, but I mean, if that's what you charge, that's what you charge, let's do this, right? Just hold your ground. I was still over here, I was silent. I wasn't saying anything. He had the conversation with himself, right? So that's what you need to do. That's what you need to do. Similar kind of thing. Recruiters on the phone. Hi, I'm Zessie. Um, I got your resume. Really excited to chat with you uh, about this role. Could you just let me know what your salary expectations are? Yeah, sure. Um, my salary expectations are 75K. Oh, wow, 75K. Oh, based on your CV, I thought that you'd be wanting to earn way less than that, like, you know, like 50 or 45. 75k oh wow Oof. i mean in this climate in this climate yeah were there any other questions you had <laughs> um hopefully you get the gist right what you're trying to avoid is this scenario so abadesi we're going to book you for that diversity and inclusion workshop you can run it over zoom how much are you going to charge us uh there'll be like 12 people in the workshop how much are you going to charge I'm going to charge doo -doo -doo, virtual 10 people, 800 pounds. 800. Oh, goodness. We've never paid 800 for a virtual workshop before. <sighs> now, if I'm not being silent, look what I might do. You haven't? Oh, okay. Um, well, I mean, I guess, I guess I could do it for um, like less. I guess, I guess I could do it for 500. 500 it is. Great. See you there. I just discounted my own opportunity to earn money. Why would I do that? Why would I do that? So um, 
silence is power. Please do not be afraid to use it. Honestly, ladies, the amount of times that silence has dragged on and I have just kept my mouth shut, like literally just like nine times out of 10, that silence ended with a yes. The other thing to remember, if you're not hearing no, you are aiming too low, okay? Now, of course, I don't want you to be going out there with like crazy baller numbers, right? Like your million pound day rate, your like 300K per annum salary, whatever. Like I'm, I'm, I'm not saying that you need to always start with sky high, right? But what I mean to say is, since no one ever comes to you with their highest budget, if you say a cost and someone immediately is like, oh, great, let's start. They're saying great because you're way cheaper than what they thought they were going to have to pay. Okay. So for example, let's say someone headhunts me. Someone headhunts me and they're like, Abadesi, can you do a guest appearance on this TV show talking about how black women navigate technology? I'd be like, oh, wow, that sounds really cool. I'd love to talk about how black women navigate technology. Um, sure, like, is this paid? Let's say they're like, yeah, of course it's paid. How much would you like to be paid? Now, I have no idea how much people get paid to appear on TV shows, right? So let's just say I said, okay, I don't know, like 100 pounds. If the person on the other side was like, oh, okay, great, yeah, let's do this, 100 pounds, come on. That was too low, okay, that was too low. Instead, I should probably be say something like, okay, so it's going to be on TV, right? 5,000 pounds? I don't know. If they're just like, ooh, wow, okay. Uh, that is like really, really expensive, but we can, we can try to make it work. I'll be honest with you. The max we budgeted for this was like 2K, 2K for half a day of filming. I don't know if you can make that work. Sure, why not? Um, another kind of thing. Let's say someone headhunts you for a full-time job. Um, sorry, I just saw something come through on, on chat. Oh, a good example. Anyway, let's say someone headhunts you for a role and it's like a new industry. This literally happened to me once. I was like working in tech and a friend who worked at a media agency asked if I could come in and meet her MD. This is like five years ago. And anyway, like I went in and the MD of this media agency was like, oh, I like to think of us like a startup. I like to think of us as embracing technology. So, you know, I want to hire someone from a tech background to join our team and help us work with corporate clients. Now, I have no idea what people at media, marketing, advertising, creative agencies get paid. Okay. I was in like a early stage startup earning like an average salary with like equity and like bonus, like performance based bonuses. Okay. At the time, I think my base salary was 48,000 pounds, 48,000 pounds. So anyway, this guy's like telling me all about this job that he's got where I like, I'm just gonna come in and like maybe like write some copy, like sell to clients and his agency. And he said to me, how much would you wanna earn? Now, I thought I was being clever, right? I was just like, okay, I earned 48, but I'm gonna say 65 because I want a pay job, right? <laughs> So I was like, well, I'm expecting 65, thinking I'm all fly. And he was like, oh, okay, great. Can you start on Monday? And then I was immediately like, damn it. That was too low. That was way too low. I was, he was so happy. People should not be happy, right? There should be some tension first where they kind of go, mm, let's, let's meet in the middle, right? That's what you want. You want, you, you want the first response to the number you share not to be joy and enthusiasm, but rather like, hmm, okay, let's find a way to make this work. That's when you're maximizing their budget. That's when you're getting the most out of their budget. Now, I've been talking about all of these negotiations like you're gonna get what you want, okay? And let's face it, the world doesn't work like that, right? The gender pay gap is real, unfortunately. So, What's gonna happen when it doesn't end up your way? No one likes to be rejected. None of us like to, but it is a reality. So you have to work on your own resilience as you work on your own negotiation skills, okay? I have become more confident as a negotiator and I have also become way more confident with hearing no, okay? Because as I became more confident in charging more money for my time and expecting more salary from my employers, 
I also, at the same time, started hearing more no's, right? Because when you start to charge more, then the cheap people can't afford you, or the people who don't value you can't afford you, right? Um, and it's something that you have to be super realistic about and be okay with, right? When I first started out with my social enterprise, for example, charging for talks, charging for workshops, I could never hear no. I just wanted anyone to say yes to me. I, I wanted to get experience, but I'm four years in now. I've won awards. I've worked with clients all around the world. I have a top 20 tech podcast in the world, regularly featured by Apple, okay? So I will ask for the money that I believe I deserve. And that means that some people can't afford me and that is okay. I have made my peace with that. Um, so, you know, you need to have a conversation with yourself about your relationship with rejection. Don't let fear of rejection, fear of failure, hold you back from asking for stuff, okay? As I mentioned at the beginning, you don't only owe it to yourself, you owe it to all women and future women to make this normal. It's only over when you decide it's over, okay? There are clients who approached me years ago to do public speaking, to do a workshop, who couldn't afford it then. Or for some reason, we couldn't make it work. That's fine. Six months later, I saw them posting on LinkedIn saying they're looking for someone to come in. So I just reopened that same old email thread where they said they couldn't afford me. And I was like, hey, I saw that post on LinkedIn. Shall we pick up this conversation again? And they'll just reply and be like, oh my gosh, I completely forgot we even talked about this. Yeah, we've got budget now. We can afford you. Come in, come in. So what I'm trying to say is, even though you might be rejected once by one person, that very same person could like down the line actually say yes. So don't be discouraged. Don't be discouraged. Uh, and, and there's no shame in that. You know, even job offers that I said no to in the past, I, I've gone back to, uh, or people have come back to me. Same thing with um, clients for my company. Uh, same thing for projects that I consult on. A conversation is only over when you decide it to be, right? Like time, very relative, very relative. It might be over for now. Just pick it up. Pick it up down the road when it makes sense to um and that's the end that's the end of uh, all three of uh my strategies preparation practice and execution like i said this this link is available uh, i'm going to stop sharing now um i have shared the google live link um in in the zoom chat so you are welcome to make a copy uh keep it if you really enjoyed this session and you enjoyed the advice that I gave, um, I'll let you know that I have a book on Amazon, it's six pounds, uh, and it's all about um, the lessons that I've learned navigating my career in tech. Each chapter covers a different challenge, whether it's building our personal brand online, dealing with rejection, negotiations, uh, full of my own personal experiences plus activities and frameworks. Um, it's actually hyperlinked at the top of this worksheet. So if you found this valuable, highly encourage you to go check it out. You can get it in paperback, you can get it in Kindle. You can also follow me and Hustle Crew on social media. I spend all of my time talking about how women can uh, do better to earn more and learn more at work. Uh, love geeking out about this stuff. Um, I just want to close the gender pay gap close the ethnic pay gap, make the world more fair and equitable. Um, so yeah, I do a lot of content on that um, and always happy to answer questions uh, and connect with people. We have got 10 minutes left uh, of my time. So now would be a great time, uh, Rochelle, Lola, maybe to ask any like really personal questions about upcoming negotiations so I can give you personalized advice if you want. Or to share any, any other challenges or questions when it comes to negotiation. Um, Sonia, our lovely moderator, did you have any questions you wanted to ask? <laughs> I think that was a great session. It was really interesting. Um, for me, the, the my key takeaway is that silence. I mm. tend to talk a lot anyway. <laughs> so I definitely agree with that silence element and it is key. Um, I think the other thing I'd echo is don't be afraid of the no. There's The opportunities will come. 
but just kind of hold down your worth. Yes. Um, my, my only other question is, if there are actual opportunities where they do not have a budget, mm. um, what, what kind of things do you negotiate on or in? So videos, yes. testimonials, pictures, like how, do you, how do you create that sentiment? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, so I think that's totally sort of an individual thing. Like we all have like goals and like metrics and things that are important to us and things that we measure. It, it could be something where I might ask to have like access to the email addresses of everyone who um, is gonna attend the event so I can add them to my email list. It might be that I ask them to like post some other things I'm promoting on their social media profiles so that I can like try to capture some of their audience. Um, it might be that um, I ask them for to buy copies of my book. So sometimes bizarrely people don't have budget to pay me but do have budget to buy copies of my book. Um, but if there's like another thing that, that, that you sell or can promote, then you could ask uh, for that. Um, one really quick question from Rochelle. So she's looking to deliver online events with partners and she wants to know how to negotiate costs for that since the formats and timings will be different. So this is a fantastic question. And I want to tell you something like I always tell my clients that they pay for the time it takes me to prepare the materials and the time it takes me to deliver them. And as a result of that, my virtual sessions are the same price as my in real life sessions. And I will say no client so far has like, seem to have an issue with this. When I tell clients, let's say um, like one of my workshops, it's an imposter syndrome workshop. It's a two hour session. I charge 1000 pounds for it. And that's because I charge 500 pounds for the preparation, 500 pounds for the delivery. So whatever is your cost breakdown in terms of you as a person and the half day or day rate that you charge for preparing and delivering, it doesn't matter whether you're going to someone's office or whether you're standing up in your lounge and doing it, you're still using time to prepare all the assets and you're still using time to chat to the people. Um, so yeah, I would just say stick to your guns and like keep your prices the same. If anything, charge more because now you have to pay for a Zoom webinar and whatever. I mean, I spent 500 something quid on <laughs> upgrading to Zoom so I could keep working with my clients. Um, but yeah, I, I would say like always, 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 always give clients a cost breakdown, right? It's very easy to say no to 5,000 pounds, but it's a lot harder to say no if the 5,000 pounds is like 1,000 for this, 2,000 for that, 500, 500, 500, 500, because when, when the client says, I can't afford 5,000 pounds, you can say, okay, well, let's take out that 500. We don't need to do that. Let's take out that 1,000. We don't need to do that. Can you afford 3,500? Then they're going to be like, oh, actually, yes, I can. So this is just a general tip for people that do part-time contract, freelance, project-based work. Always quote a cost that is a composite of different units. So that people who don't have budget, uh, or their budget is changing, don't have to assume they can no longer work with you. Rather, they assume that they're gonna work with you in a different way, like with a different combination of items. Um, someone's just asked, um, working for the career service, what advice would you give to students from underrepresented groups in terms of building that initial confidence on pricing themselves? Um, yeah, that is a really great question. It's, it's tough out there for students and grads. I graduated in the last recession, so I, I feel their pain. I empathize with them so much. I mean, if anything, this is a lot scarier, probably. Um, I think that the first rule of thumb for people just entering the workplace is to just get comfortable with negotiating. Like, I don't think students should worry too much about pricing themselves. I think my first graduate salary was 25K. And I remember I asked for more just because I had read that you should never accept your first offer. And so when they got me my first offer, I said, I would like 26K. And they were like, okay, great. <laughs> Thankfully, my negotiation skills have evolved since then. Um, but I would say that, um, the, the best thing for a student to do right now is to like, as soon as they get anything, if they can just like push back and ask for more and just get used to like not saying yes 
to the first thing. But I think it's going to be really difficult to think of like benchmarking and stuff like that for students, just because, I mean, that's the point in your career where you have the most competition. You have so much to prove. And, you know, I was of the mindset that I just wanted to get my foot in the door uh, and then take it from there. And I think in this climate, it's probably the best advice for them too. like, just get your foot in the door. And then when things are better on a macro level, you can jump, you can move, you can ask for more. Um, but, but yeah, uh, that would be my advice. <laughs> Um, I'll just share um, before we wrap up uh, the book that 